Well, hello everybody. Welcome back. This is presentation number eight in a series of ten. You'll notice that the subject that we're studying is the great cosmic controversy. And the subtitle is How God Clears His Name of All False Charges. Now in our study this evening, our topic will be Living Without an Intercessor. We will deal with the close of probation and briefly with events that take place after the close of probation. But before we do, we want to do what we always do before we open God's Word, and that is to pray that the Spirit who revealed Scripture will come back to explain it to us. And so I invite you to bow your heads reverently as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you have poured out upon us. We can't even begin to number the blessings that we have received from your hand. We especially thank you for your word, which is a sure guide in a world that is so confused. We ask, Father, that you will be with us through the ministration of your Holy Spirit. Open our minds and hearts so that we might understand and receive the seed of truth that you would plant in our hearts and in our minds. And we thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Daniel, chapter 7. And we're going to read verses 9 and 10, and then we'll jump down to verses 13 and 14. Uh, we've read these verses before, but now we are going to summarize a few things that we've mentioned before and move on to new territory. Now, Daniel chapter 7 has a certain sequence of events. We have the lion that represents Babylon. We have the bear that represents Medo-Persia. The leopard symbolizes Greece. The dragon beast is the Roman Empire. Then the dragon beast sprouts ten horns, which is the division of the Roman Empire. And then you have a little horn that rules for 1,260 years that end in the year 1798. And then we have the following event immediately mentioned after the little horn, uh, horn's first period of rule comes to an end. Daniel 7, verses 9 and 10. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. Who is the Ancient of Days? God the Father. And where does God the Father live? Our Father which art in heaven, we pray. So it says, the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. And now notice, the court was seated and the books were opened. So after which date does the judgment begin? It has to begin sometime after what date? After 1798. And we've specified that it began when? October 22nd, 1844. Now, this is not the end of the story. Because it says the court was seated and the books were opened. But then there's another person that is going to join the Ancient of Days in the throne room, in the most holy place. Let's go down to verse 13. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. Who is that? That's Jesus Christ. One like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds. What are the clouds? The angels coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to where? To the Ancient of Days. Is this the second coming of Jesus? It can't be the second coming because Jesus here comes on the clouds, but not to the earth. He comes to where? To the Ancient of Days in the most holy place. So it says here, He came to the Ancient of Days, and they, that is the angels, brought Him near before Him. Now why did Jesus go in there? What was the purpose of Jesus going into the place where the court was seated and the books were opened? Verse 14 tells us why He went into the presence of the Father. Verse 14 reads, Then to Him, to whom? To Jesus, very well. Then to him was given dominion and glory and what? And a kingdom. So what did Jesus go there for? He went there to receive what? 
the kingdom. So it says, Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Now the question is, what is Christ's kingdom? We've touched on this point before. Usually we think of a kingdom in territorial terms, don't we? The territory or the geographical area over which an individual rules. But when it comes to Jesus, His kingdom is composed of the people that belong to His kingdom. In other words, His kingdom are His people. So what did Jesus go to do before the Father? He went to perform a work of judgment to decide who is truly a member of His kingdom. Are you following me or not? And after the last person who has professed Jesus Christ as Savior has been judged, the kingdom of Jesus is what? The kingdom of Jesus is complete. So in other words, the judgment process reveals who was a true follower of Jesus and who wasn't. And as soon as all cases have been decided, then the kingdom of Jesus is made up. That's what Jesus went before the Father to receive. To receive the kingdom to determine who are the subjects of His kingdom. I want to read a statement from Great Controversy, page 428, uh, where Ellen White uh, describes this judgment process and what happens when every case has been decided. It's a short statement, but very meaningful. When the work of investigation shall be ended, that is, when everybody who has professed the name of Christ has been evaluated in the judgment, when the work of investigation shall be ended, when the cases of those who, in all ages, have professed to be followers of Christ, are you catching that? So how many people are judged? How many of those? All. And who are the ones that are judged? Not, not only true believers, but those who have what? Professed to be followers of Christ. So she says, when the work of investigation shall be ended, when the cases of those who in all ages have professed to be followers of Christ have been examined and decided, then, and not till then, probation will close and the door of mercy will be shut. Are you with me? Now, when the door of mercy is shut, that's the moment when the sentence is pronounced, either for life or not for life. When do those people who have been judged favorably receive their reward? They receive the reward when Jesus comes. Is there a period of time between when the sentence is given and when those who are faithful to Jesus receive their reward? Yeah. Yes. In between those two points, when probation closes and when Jesus comes to reward His people by taking them to heaven, there is what the Bible calls the time of trouble. Now that would be the subject of study for our next lecture, lecture number nine in this series. But uh, we're not going to deal specifically with that now. But I want you to catch the chronology. You have the close of probation, then later you have the uh, receiving of the reward, and in between you have the seven last plagues and the tribulation or the time of trouble. Now let's discuss the close of probation. Let's go in our Bibles to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. Now this verse is not directly related to what we're studying, but I'm reading it for a specific purpose and you're going to see why. It says there in Daniel 12 verse 4, But you, Daniel... Shut up the words and seal the book. Now, was the book going to be sealed forever? No, because it says seal the book until when? Until the time of the end. So, if the book is shut and sealed, can people get a message from the book? Can the people read the book and understand the book? No, because it's shut and it's sealed. So if the book is shut, a message cannot come from it. Now notice, it says, until the time of the end, and then it, it states, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. And that's been severely misinterpreted. 
Because basically, uh, the way that it is generally used is that, you know, the, when it says knowledge shall be increased, it's talking about airplanes and, and uh, missiles and uh, electric toothbrushes and, and all of this technology stuff. But that's not what the text is saying. What the text is saying is that the book, in this case, it's a particular portion of the book of Daniel, is shut and sealed. In other words, it cannot be understood. A message cannot come from it until the time of the end. But at the time of the end, people are going to run to and fro, and knowledge of the book is going to increase because the book will then be what? The book will then be unsealed. The book will be opened. We could, would it be too much to say that the secrets will be unsealed? Now, let's go to Revelation 22 and verses 10 through 12. Revelation chapter 22, 10 through 12. And what I want you to notice is that there are three points of time in these verses. Three points of time. Revelation 22, verses 10 through 12. You'll see why I read that verse about the book being sealed, about the book being shut. And he said to me, Do not seal... That's the opposite, isn't it? Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book. It's talking about Revelation. Now, what does that mean? Don't seal the words of the prophecy of this book. Can the book of Revelation be understood? Can a message come forth from it? Can people receive the message and be saved by studying the book of Revelation? Yes, because it says here, don't shut up the book. So if the book is open, a message of salvation can come from it. That's the first point of time. The book is opened, everybody can read it and understand it and be saved. But now comes the second point. It says, for the time is at hand. In other words, the book is open now, but there's a time, a certain event that's going to take place at a certain time. What is that event that is going to take place? Let's read the rest of, of verse 10. For the time is at hand. He who is unjust... Let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Does this sound pretty, uh, uh, pretty determinative? Does, does this sound like all cases are decided? Yeah. Absolutely. In other words, when this takes place, the book will no longer be opened to present a message that will bring salvation. The time has come for where all cases have been decided, the unjust will continue to be unjust, the filthy will continue to be filthy, the righteous will continue to be righteous, and the holy will continue to be holy. But there's a third point of time, and that's in verse 12. Notice, it says there in verse 12, and Jesus is speaking, and behold, I am coming quickly, and what? and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. That's the second coming of Christ, isn't it? So do you notice three points of time in these verses? First of all, the book is open. A message of salvation can come from it. Oh, but the time is going to come when all cases are what? Decided. And then Jesus is going to what? He's going to come and he's going to bring his reward. So does probation close before Jesus comes to reward the saints? Yes. Absolutely. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 15 and verses 5 through 8. Revelation 15 verses 5 through 8. Now let me just mention that at this point the three angels' messages have been proclaimed. You know the three angels' messages are God's last message to the world. They're found in Revelation chapter 14 and verses 6 through 12. As long as the three messages are being preached... The door of probation is open. But the time is coming when the door of probation is going to close. Notice Revelation chapter 15, verses 5 through 8. Do you remember that we read once before in Revelation eleven nineteen 19, that the temple of God was opened in heaven and the ark of his covenant was seen? And that refers to the beginning of the judgment. Could people enter by faith to follow what Jesus was doing in the most holy place? Absolutely, we studied that. But now I want you to notice that the temple is going to be opened again. The most holy place is going to be opened again, but this time it's not open for people to be able to go in by faith to see what Jesus is doing, to sympathize with His work. Remember what the people did on the Day of Atonement? This time it is opened to let 
the plague angels come out to pour their plagues out upon the earth. Notice Revelation 15, verse 5. After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony was opened. In heaven was opened. Now, I want you to understand what the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony is. The tabernacle of the testimony is the tent. It's called the tabernacle. The holy and the most holy place. But what is the temple of the tabernacle? The temple of the tabernacle is the most holy place. So what is being opened here? The most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And now notice verse 6. And out of the temple, what? Out of the temple came the seven angels, having seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, and having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls, full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. Why is the temple opened? It's not open for people to go in now and be saved. It's opened to let the plague angels out. Has probation closed when the plagues begin to be poured out? Yeah. Absolutely. So this is talking about the close of human probation. Now, will God's people be able to enter the most holy place by faith once this take place, takes place? No. Notice verse 8. The temple, that's the most holy place, the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. And no one was able to what? To enter the temple, that's the most holy place, till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Are God's people, uh, the living saints, are they going to be able to serve God in the temple day and night according to the book of Revelation after Jesus comes? Yes. yes. But after probation closes and until the plagues are all poured out, is anybody going to be able to enter the temple to be saved to claim Jesus as the mediator or the intercessor? No. It says, no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. And the reason why is because when the seven angels are pouring out the bowls, when they're pouring out the plagues, probation has closed. Jesus has finished his ministration and no one can enter there by faith. You say, well, can we really enter the most holy place? Of course we can. We enter by faith, don't we? Doesn't the Bible say that we can draw, draw near to the throne of God in Hebrews chapter 4? Yes, we don't do so physically because it says that this temple is in heaven, but we do it in our mind. We do it by following Jesus in the sanctuary in the work that He is performing. Now let's go to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12, and I want to read verse 1. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. It says, at that time... Incidentally, let me give you a little bit of context before I finish reading this. Uh, if you read the previous verses, it talks about the king of the north. The king of the north represents the papacy. It's the same thing as the little horn, the beast, the man of sin, the harlot, the abomination of desolation, you know, uh, the antichrist. All are names of this system, different names given in different contexts. And so it says there in the previous verses, Daniel 11, 44 and 45, that the king of the north will go out with the intention of destroying and slaying God's people. It's the same as Revelation 13 where it says that a death decree is given against God's people. People will not be able to buy or sell, and those who do not worship the image of the beast will be what? Will be killed. So those two texts are uh, to be studied together. So it says here, at that time, when the king of the north goes out to destroy God's people, Michael shall stand up. Now the question is, what does that mean, Michael shall stand up? Well, we need to go to Daniel 11 and verses 2 and 3, where the identical expression is used. Daniel chapter 11 and verses 2 and 3. It says there, And now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia. Now, unfortunately, the translation doesn't reflect the fact that it's the same word. In other words, the word arise that is used here in Daniel 11 verse 2 is the same identical word stand up that is used in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. So what does this mean when it says three more kings will arise in Persia? It means that three more kings are going to rule in Persia, right? Three more kings are going to reign in Persia. Now, let's continue reading. 
And the fourth shall be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. Then a mighty king shall arise. There's the same expression. A mighty king shall stand up. What does that mean? It means he's going to begin to what? He's going to begin to rule or to reign. And it, that's what it says. Who shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will? So the question is, what does it mean that Michael will stand up? Michael is whom? Jesus Christ. Who is like God is the name of the word uh, of the name Michael. So what does it mean for Michael to stand up? It means that Jesus is going to begin to what? He's going to begin to reign or rule. Why? Because probation is just closed and his kingdom is what? His kingdom is made up. Are you following me or not? His kingdom is made up because the judgment has finished. Now he's going to stand up, which means he's going to be, begin to rule over his kingdom, which has been established during the investigative judgment. So, does probation close before Jesus comes? Let's finish reading Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up. That's, he begin to rule because his kingdom is complete. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and now listen carefully, and there shall be a time of trouble. Does this come after he stands up, after he begins to rule? Yeah. Yes. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. So is there going to be a time of trouble after probation closes? Yeah. And before Jesus comes? Yes. It continues saying, There shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And then comes the deliverance. And, and at that time, your people shall be what? Delivered. delivered. That's the coming of Jesus. Shall be delivered everyone who is found written in the book. Why are they written in the book? Because they were judged and they were accounted worthy to be in the book. In the judgment that was done previously. Are you with me or not? All of this fits together and it makes sense. Now, there's another story in the Bible that shows that probation will close and there will be a period of time between the close of probation and the coming of Jesus. I'm referring to what happened in the days of Noah. Noah preached a powerful message, didn't he? For 120 years. Could we say that the book was opened, so to speak, during those 120 years? Was a message shared? Could people be saved? Most certainly. But then what happened? Notice Genesis chapter 7, verse 16. When Noah finishes his preaching, something happens. Genesis 7 verse 16 says, So those that entered, male and female, talking about the animals, of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. So was the door shut? Yeah. Who shut the door? The Lord shut the door. So as soon as the door was closed, it started to rain. Nope. How long went by between when the door closed and it started to rain? When the destruction came? Seven days. Do you think that during that period the faith of Noah and his family was severely tested? How do you think that the people outside behaved for each day that went by? They became more and more violent and more and more daring. Was there a time of trouble, so to speak, for Noah and his family inside the ark? Was it a day of victory for the wicked who were outside? Yes, it was. Jesus referred to this in Matthew chapter 24 and verses 37 to 39. Go with me to Matthew 24, verses 37 to 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Do you see the two events that are, going, that are being compared? As it was in the days of Noah, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking marrying and giving in marriage, now comes the first until, until the day that Noah entered the ark. So the first until marks the moment when Noah entered the ark and the door was what? And the door was closed. But now notice, and they did not know, who didn't know? The people outside. What didn't they know? That they were lost, that's right. And they did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So is the door of probation going to close before Jesus comes? Yes. 
Is there going to be a time of trouble in between where the faith of God's people will be tested and the wicked will become more and more daring against God's people? Absolutely. Because Jesus says, as it was back then, it will be at the end of time. Incidentally, Jesus spoke of his coming like the coming of a thief. And, and people say, oh, the second coming is going to be like, like the coming of a thief. Uh, not exactly. Not the way that we generally think of it anyway. I want you to imagine, you know, it's a, a, one of those cold nights in Fresno. There's not very many of them, but it's in December, and it's, in the, it's 30 degrees, and you've come back from work, and, you know, you've had supper, and, and uh, you jump into bed, you know, you lowered the thermostat, and you jumped into bed, and you're under the covers, and all of a sudden you say, oh, no, I forgot to lock the door. Oh, it's so nice and warm under these covers. I just hate to get out to lock the door. I've lived here for 25 years, and the thief has never come in 25 years. So the person stays in bed. Lo and behold, unexpectedly, while everybody in the house is sleeping, the thief comes and he finds the door open. He goes in and he steals uh, the, you know, the television, praise the Lord. Uh, he... <laughs> He steals the video camera. He steals your cell phone. He steals some money. Oh, he, he has a heyday. Is, does anybody in the house know that the thief has come? No, because everybody's what? Sleeping. That's why Jesus said, watch. He's not saying watch for the second coming. He's saying watch for the close of probation. When do the people inside the house realize that the thief has been there? Is there a period of time that passes between when the thief comes and when the people discover that the thief has come? Yes. When do they discover it? In the morning when they wake up, but then it is too late. You know, the whole Christian world thinks that they can be saved up to the moment that Jesus is coming in the clouds. You know, Jesus is I'm yours, Lord. It's not going to happen that way. Because probation will close before the second coming of Jesus, and there will be a severe time of trouble in between. Must we prepare for that time of trouble? By the way, that's going to be our next study together. We're going to study about that time of trouble. In fact, let's say a few things about the time of trouble. You see, Satan complains that God has never allowed him to fully implement his style of government. He says to God, you always interfere. You don't give me free reign. If you allowed me free reign to attack your, your people, you would see that they serve you not because they love you, they serve you because of the loaves and the fishes. But you just don't let me get at them. But if you gave me just one chance to have full control of the planet, I would show that my style of government is better than yours. So what is God going to do? God is going to say, is that the case? You remember the story of Job, by the way? In our next lecture, we're going to take a closer look at that story of Job. That is a prophetic story. Are all of the heavenly beings observing what is happening in this story? In the book of Job? Is the heavenly jury there? Yeah. And Satan comes and he says, oh, you know, Job serves you. Of course he's blameless and perfect because you give him everything. You don't let me touch him. You protect him. But he serves you out of self-interest. If you allowed me access to him, he would blaspheme you to your face. Now, God could have said, you're a liar, and left it at that. And the heavenly beings probably would have wondered, um, what is God afraid of? So God says, okay, go for it. Only you can't touch him. And so the devil takes everything away from Job. And then you have a second meeting in heaven. Uh, the heavenly beings have seen that God is right, because Job says God gave and God has taken away. Praise be the name of the Lord. In this, Job did not sin. And so when, it, when you have the second meeting, uh, God says, Oh, have you seen my servant Job? He's still faithful in spite of the fact that you turned me against him. Ha! The devil says, Of course, because you didn't let me touch him. But if you let me touch him, you would see he serves you because you're good to him. God could say, You're a liar. Don't believe him. But God knows that the heavenly beings would say, Well, you know, maybe, maybe the devil is right. So God says, Go for it. Do whatever you want to him except I will not allow you to kill him, because if you kill him, the trial is over. And so the devil goes out and he afflicts Job with boils from the tip of his head to the bottom, to the soles of his feet. He loses the support of his wife. He loses the support of his friends. And he even appears to lose the support of God. 
and he cries out chapter after chapter, why have you turned against me, O oh God? But he doesn't give up his faith. He says, I know my Redeemer lives. He says, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. He never lets go of the hand of God. Even though he, he's asking, why have you forsaken me? Incidentally, did Jesus ask that same question, why have you forsaken me? Absolutely, Jesus went through the experience of Job. So the Bible tells us that after Michael stands up, after Jesus begins to reign, there is going to be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. Notice how it's described in Matthew chapter 24 and verses 21 and 22. Matthew 24 verses 21 and 22. Jesus described this tribulation in terms similar to Daniel 12 verse 1. It says, For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And it's going to be so terrible, according to verse 22, that unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be what? Shortened. Now listen up, folks. God is going to allow Satan to afflict his people. He is going to allow the devil to try them and test them to the utmost. They will lose everything, like Job did. They will lose possessions, they will lose houses, they will lose lands, they will lose their health, they will lose the support of family and friends, and they will even begin to fear that they have lost their best friend, which is God, and they will struggle with whether they have any sins that stand between them and God. The devil will be given free reign, except that God will say to the devil, you can test them to the utmost so that the heavenly universe can see that they serve me because they love me. And not out of self-interest. Is God giving a revelation of his character in contrast to the character of Satan in the time of trouble? He most certainly is. And we're going to study this a little bit more in our next lecture together. So, the devil will be allowed to implement his plan without any interference by God except that God would not allow His people to be slain. God's people will go through an experience similar to that of Job and they will not let loose of the hand of the Lord. In fact, Ellen White has explained that God's people will go through a similar experience to the experience that Jesus went through in Gethsemane and on the cross. Let me read you this statement from Review and Herald, April 14, 1896, where Ellen White is describing what is going to happen uh, with, with God's people. The forces of darkness, of the powers of darkness, will unite with human agents who have given themselves unto the control of Satan. And the same scenes that were exhibited at the trial, rejection, and crucifixion of Christ will be revived. Wow. So are God's people going to cry out, why have you forsaken me? Absolutely. Do you know when Jesus hung on the cross, he had nothing, not even his clothes. He had lost everything. And it appeared like he'd lost the support of his father too. But his father was close by. Jesus did not go by his feelings. He went by the promises of his father that if he was faithful, his father was going to resurrect him on the third day. That's why he commended his spirit into the hands of his father. So she says the same scenes that were exhibited at the trial, rejection, and crucifixion of Christ will be revived. Through yielding to satanic influences, men will be merged into fiends. That is, men will become demons. And those who were created in the image of God who were formed to honor and glorify their creator, will become the habitation of dragons, and Satan will see in an apostate race his masterpiece of evil, men who reflect his own image. That's what this world is going to be like in the time of trouble. And you know, sometimes uh, preachers try to scare people into serving the Lord and saying, you're not going to have an intercessor. God's going to leave you here. Listen, folks, we are not going to have anybody to intercede for our sins, but Jesus will be our protector. Because if Jesus is not the protector, nobody would survive. Now, after probation closes, and the time of trouble is about to begin, a special ceremony takes place. The last ceremony on the Day of Atonement. It's known as the scapegoat ceremony. 
you see two goats were chosen. One for the Lord, that one was sacrificed, the blood was shed, represents the death of Christ. The other, uh, the other goat, the other male goat, was not slain. That goat was, was brought to the entrance to the tent. In other words, he's in the court of the sanctuary. And the high priest would come through the most holy place and then through the holy place to the door of the holy place where the scapegoat was waiting in the court. And you say, where does the Bible say that? Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 7 tells us, He, that is the high priest, shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Are you catching the picture? What does the court represent? The court represents the earth. In heaven there is no court. Because the work of the court was performed by Jesus on earth. You see, Jesus died on earth and he resurrected on earth and he lived in our camp on earth. So the heavenly sanctuary has a holy and most holy place, but there's no court because the work represented by the court was fulfilled by Jesus while he was here on the earth. Are you following me or not? And so where will the scapegoat be when this is finally fulfilled? He will be on earth. And Jesus, the high priest, will come out and he will perform this Azazel ceremony, this scapegoat ceremony. He will bring all of the sins that were introduced into the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus. All of the sins that were forgiven. And he's going to bring all of those sins to the entrance of the tabernacle of meeting, and he will place both hands on the head of the scapegoat. In this case, what does the scapegoat represent? The scapegoat represents Satan and all of the sins of the righteous that were placed in the sanctuary through the blood will be placed upon the head of the scapegoat who is ultimately responsible for the origin and the perpetuation of sin. Now some people say, well, Pastor Bohr, Adventists believe that Satan is their savior because the sins are placed on the head of the scapegoat. Well, the fact is that, uh, that those who say that are not careful in their analysis. Let me tell you the reason why, just because the, the final responsibility for the sins that Satan led God's people to commit are placed on the head of the scapegoat, it doesn't mean that the scapegoat is our savior. Five points that I want to mention. Number one, Clearly, the two goats are opposites. Some scholars say both goats represent Jesus. No, no, no. It says in Leviticus chapter 16, verses 8 through 10, that one is for the Lord, and the other is for Azazel. Incidentally, in Jewish tradition, and we don't go by Jewish tradition, but it's interesting to notice that, for example, in the book, uh, Ethiopian book of Enoch, it states that... Uh, Azazel was a malignant being, the originator of sin, and the leader of the rebellious angels. So the Jews understood that Azazel represented a malignant spirit. Furthermore, when the sins are placed upon the scapegoat, the sanctuary had already been cleansed. So, so the scapegoat is not cleansing the sanctuary. The blood of Jesus cleansed the sanctuary, and then the final responsibility is placed on the head of the scapegoat. Furthermore, the blood of the scapegoat was not shed. And it says in Hebrews 9.22 that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sins. So the scapegoat was not sacrificed to forgive sin. He bore the ultimate responsibility for sin. And finally, the scapegoat was sent to the wilderness where there was no inhabitant. You can find that in Leviticus 16, verse 22. Can you think of a passage in the book of Revelation where a certain being is sent to a desolate wilderness where there are no inhabitants? Revelation chapter 20. It says that a mighty angel descends from heaven with a chain in his hand, and he's going to chain the devil to a desolate planet which is without form and void, according to Jeremiah chapter 4, and where all of his followers are what? Are dead. And so clearly, the one who bears the ultimate responsibility for the sins of the righteous is Satan. Now the wicked, they're going to suffer their own penalty because they did not place their sins into the sanctuary. Now, there's a question that comes up many times, and that is, did Jesus suffer? the second death. 
You know, I was one, once had a conversation with uh, an evangelical. He was not a Seventh-day Adventist. And uh, I asked him this question. Which death is the wages of sin? The first death or the second death? And of course, he says, oh, it's very clear that the wages of sin, the final penalty for sin, is second death. I said, well, that's a good answer. Then I asked him, what is second death? And he was pretty well versed theologically. He says, well, uh, second death is eternal separation from God. And I looked at him and I said, yeah, okay, it's a good answer. And then I asked him, did Jesus suffer the second death? And uh, the, he didn't answer as quickly now. <laughs> he said, well, yes, he did. And so then I asked him the question. I said, if Jesus suffered the second death, and the second death is eternal separation from God, why isn't Jesus separated from God? Are you understanding my question? There was a long silence. He said, I don't know. I said, I do. <laughs> he says, what do you mean? I told him about the scapegoat ceremony. Who is it that's going to suffer second death for all of the sins that he led God's faithful people to commit? Satan. Are the wicked also going to suffer second death for their own sins because they did not place them in the sanctuary? Absolutely. So the scapegoat ceremony is the only way that we, ex we can explain why Jesus is not eternally separated from His Father. It's because the ultimate originator and perpetuator of sin is going to. Are you following me or not? Now, when Jesus returns the second time, He will be free of the stain of sin because He will have cleansed the sanctuary and placed the sins where they belong. Notice Hebrews chapter 9, verses 27 and 28. Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who are eagerly uh, waiting for Him, He will appear a second time, and now notice this, apart from sin for salvation. Why will He appear apart from sin? Because all of the sins have been placed where? on the head of the scapegoat. And then I'll tell you what the high priest would do. After he had placed all of the responsibility upon the head of the scapegoat, then the high priest would return to the most holy place and he would change his garments. He would take off his high priestly garments and he would change. Now, I was once talking to, uh, to some uh, Seventh-day Adventist uh, pastor who didn't uh, much believe in what Ellen White says. You know, Ellen White explains that um, uh, Jesus, before he comes, he's going to change his garments from his high priestly garments. He's going to change to his kingly garments. So he says that, Ellen White says that, but where does the Bible say that? And, uh, you know, he was being facetious in his question. He was being somewhat sarcastic, so I decided I would be sarcastic too. I said, well, if you used half of that gray matter that God put in your brain, you would be able to figure it out. He says, what do you mean? I said, listen, what is Jesus doing now? What is the function of Jesus in heaven now? Oh, he says, that's simple. He's high priest. I said, good. I said, if he's the high priest, how is he clothed? Oh, well, if he's serving as a high priest, he must be clothed then as a high priest. I said, good, two for two. And then I said, when Jesus returns to this earth, how is he clothed? Oh, there was a long time of silence because he knew all about Revelation chapter 19 that speaks about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Let's read Revelation 19 and verses 11 through 15. Revelation 19 verses 11 through 15. This is the second coming of Christ. How does Jesus come clothed at the second coming? Does he come clothed as a high priest? No. So, so it's very simple. If Jesus is now clothed as a high priest, but when he returns again, he returns clothed as a king, Sometime before he came as a king, he must have changed. Notice Revelation 19, verse 11. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew him except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven 
clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with the rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, what? King of kings and Lord of lords. So is Jesus going to come again clothed as a high priest? No. So he must have changed at some moment before that. Now, let me read you a rather long statement from Ellen White. The little lady had it straight. This is from early writings. This is the early Ellen White. Because some people say, well, Ellen White, as she matured, you know, she clarified certain things that she didn't make clear early in her ministry. This is early writings. She makes it very clear. In fact, early writings is even clearer, I believe, than Great Controversy because it's done in a very synthetic short form. So you can follow the sequence a lot easier. Notice, every case had been decided for life or death. This is at the conclusion of the judgment. While Jesus had been ministering in the sanctuary, the judgment had been going on for the righteous dead and then for the righteous living. Christ had, now listen carefully, Christ had received his kingdom. That's Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Having made atonement for his people and blotted out their sins. The subjects of his kingdom were made up. So what does it mean that he received his kingdom? The subjects of his kingdom were made up. The marriage of the Lamb was consummated, and the kingdom and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven was given to Jesus and the heirs of salvation, and Jesus was to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. As Jesus moved out of the most holy place, I heard the tinkling of the bells upon his garment. And as he left, a cloud of darkness covered the inhabitants of the earth. There was then no mediator between guilty man and an offended God. If Jesus takes off his high priestly garments when probation closes, is there going to be any intercessor during the time of trouble? No, because he's no longer a high priest. She continues saying, There was then no mediator between guilty man and an offended God. While Jesus had been standing between God and guilty man, a restraint was upon the people. But when he stepped out from between man and the Father, the restraint was removed, and Satan had entire control of the finally impenitent. See, that's what we were talking about, like Job. God says, okay, you say that you can rule better than me? Show it. How do you think heaven is going to look at it? You say, man, are we ever glad we didn't let this guy take over God's throne? What a mess! She continues writing, It was impossible for the plagues to be poured out while Jesus officiated in the sanctuary. But as his work there is finished and his intercession, intercession closes, there is nothing to stay the wrath of God. And it breaks with fury upon the shelterless head of the guilty sinner who has slighted salvation and hated reproof. In that fearful time, after the close of Jesus' mediation, the saints were living in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor. Some Adventist theologians cringe when they read this because it means that you can no longer send your sins to the sanctuary. She continues writing, Every case was decided, every jewel numbered. Jesus tarried a moment in the outer apartment of the heavenly sanctuary, and the sins which had been confessed while he was in the most holy place were placed upon Satan, the originator of sin, who must suffer their punishment. See, there's the, the scapegoat ceremony. Then I saw Jesus lay off his priestly attire and clothe himself with his most kingly robes. Upon his head were many crowns, a crown within a crown, surrounded by the angelic host. He left heaven. He left heaven for where? He left heaven for planet earth, because that is his second coming. Is this clear? I mean, the Bible makes it absolutely clear. And the spirit of prophecy explains it in such a simple way. She puts all of the pieces together in a way that can be easily understood. And then, of course, probation has closed. 
The sentence has been given. The time of trouble, Satan has full control over the finally impenitent. God allows the devil to try his people to the utmost. They go through this severe time of trouble. There is no intercessor, no mediator, which means that they have totally gained the victory over sin. And at the end of the time of trouble, then Jesus will come to bring his reward to his saints, which he showed in the judgment before, were worthy of receiving the reward of everlasting life. Amen. Let's notice John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. So Jesus didn't go to build mansions. They were already there when he was speaking. If it were not so, he says, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. How does he prepare the place? By his work in the holy place and the most holy place. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will what? I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Now listen carefully. Jesus made two promises to his people about their final inheritance. First of all, he clearly said that he was going to take them to heaven. Is that clear from John chapter 14? Yes. He says, I'm going to prepare a place and then I will go, go there with you. I'll receive you unto myself and we'll be in heaven together. Did Jesus promise to take his people to heaven? That was his first promise with regards to inheritance. But did Jesus also say that the meek will inherit the earth? So the question is, you know, what are we going to inherit? Is it heaven or is it the new earth? You know, this causes a severe problem for those who believe in the rapture. Because those who believe in the rapture believe that Jesus will reign on this earth during the millennium. And they say, well, that's the fulfillment of the promise that Jesus would uh, give the, the saints the earth to inherit. But they say, what about the first promise that he was going to take them to heaven? So they have to invent a pre-tribulation rapture seven years before Jesus comes to stay on this earth. They have to create a pre-tribulation rapture. They say, oh yeah, Jesus is going to fulfill his first promise, taking his people to heaven for seven years, and then he's going to come here during the millennium, and the meek will inherit the earth. It's not necessary to invent a pre-tribulation rapture to understand that Jesus fulfills both promises. You see, Adventists have it in a much clearer way. How does Jesus fulfill the promise to, to take his people to heaven? He comes the second time, he takes them to heaven, where they spend how long? A thousand years. So in other words, the problem with the ones who believe in the pre-tribulation rapture is that they got the millennium wrong. If you get wrong where Jesus is going to be during the millennium, you have to have a pre-tribulation rapture. I don't know if you're understanding what I'm saying. But if you go by what the Bible says, if you believe that Jesus is going to be in heaven and the saints are going to reign with him and they're going to perform a work of judgment during the thousand years and then after the thousand years Jesus will come and set up his kingdom here and the meek will inherit the earth, it's much more natural to understand how Jesus fulfills both promises. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Yes. Now let's read Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12. Revelation 22 verse 12, we're still referring to the reward when Jesus comes. And behold... I am coming quickly, Jesus says, and my what? And my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Now, if Jesus brings the reward, must he have determined before he came what the reward will be? Yes. Must there have been a judgment before to determine the reward? Yes. Of course. Notice 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. You know, Christians today, they say, oh, you know, the apostle Paul, he was a good guy. When he died, he went right to heaven. That's not what Paul believed. When did Paul believe he was going to get his reward? When was he going to get his crown? Let's read what he had to say shortly before his death, when he was in the Mamertine prison in Rome. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me when I die. No, on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved His appearing. 
So when is it that Paul was going to receive the crown of life? At the appearing of Jesus. It's another way of saying at the coming of Jesus. Notice Matthew 16, verse 27. Matthew 16, verse 27. The Bible is clear as to when people receive their reward. Listen, if you receive your reward when Jesus come, comes, you did not receive it when you died. It's that simple. So if you understand the judgment, you understand the state of the dead. Notice Matthew 16, verse 27. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father with His angels. Is that the second coming? Yes. And then, He's going to come and then He will what? He will reward each one according to His works. So when is it that people are going to receive their rewards? Not at death, but when Jesus comes again. The Bible is so clear on this point. And when was it determined what reward would be given? In the judgment that was done before, were the names of God's people retained in the book during that judgment? Yes, because He will deliver those who are written where? In the book, according to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Let's read one final passage on the reward. This is read at every funeral that I have ever attended in the history of my life. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 15 through 17. Beautiful promise. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. The living are not going to go to heaven before those who died, in other words. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. So where are the dead? In heaven? No. The dead in Christ will rise first. Notice. Then we who are alive and remain, those who are alive when Jesus comes, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, with those who died and resurrected in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And then God's people will receive their reward. They will be taken to heaven for a thousand years. What are they going to do during the thousand years? It is going to be a working vacation. This will be uh, our final study. We're going to discover what God's people are going to do during the millennium. There is going to be an investigative judgment of Satan, his angels, and the wicked during the thousand years. And then after the thousand years, when Satan and his angels are there and all the wicked have resurrected, God will once again open up the records and show the wicked and Satan and his angels their records. And then they will kneel and they say, Righteous and true are your ways, O God. For the first time since sin came in, everybody will be on the same page in the great controversy. So don't miss the next exciting episode.